this period, we're really looking at what solutions we have for developing and repurposing. And I want to welcome Turner and Townsend and their partners. We have Robert Gishohi moderating a session together with the panel to discuss that very topic, developing and repurposing for a new era. Now, um, I will let uh, Robert first, of course, introduce himself and then uh, have a short period where he can intervene, followed by the panel. And this is really just looking at uh, how the retail and corporate office landlords, developers can reposition your buildings into assets that regional and international companies are looking for. Is there a case for repurposing assets to data centers, to healthcare facilities, or to other asset classes? Robert, over to you. Thank you very much, Renee, and thank you for giving us this wonderful platform to be able to share our knowledge, our insights as to all we know and have amassed in our experience as far as the purposing is concerned, as you had myself. And myself, my name is Robert Kishohi. I look after project management in Tana and Townsend. We are a project management and a cost management firm, a global firm that offers consultancy in those two main sectors. And we take health and safety very, very important in Tana and Townsend. So I'd like to start off with a health and safety moment. And today's health and safety moment is let someone know if you are working alone. In this digital era, we find ourselves working from home, working remotely. Uh, please let someone know if you're working alone in case of any incidents. Now, purpose is something that we have had in different quarters, be it in our companies, be it in a corporate setup, be it in our own individual lives. So it's not a new thing that we are discussing about repurposing. Today's topic will be uh, a deep dive into what we are observing as far as repurposing is concerned in the different uh, markets that we operate in. And we have a panel that is uh, drawn from all parts of the globe and they'll be sharing their insights as to what they are seeing in the trends. We will be exploring elements uh, to do with uh, the nuances around repurposing, the complexities. And a growing number of property developers have opted to halt investments in construction of commercial and res residential properties as many struggle with low returns and shrinking occupancies. And as a result of low occupancy levels, rental incomes, which have in turn led to low gains, some property developers have had a shift to shift their focus to adaptive reuses of their properties. It's against this background that we have assembled a panel of very distinguished professionals from all over the world to share their insights, opinions, experiences, and assets, and to see whether we can sort of demystify this repurposing. Now, as one of our, uh, one of our colleagues mentioned uh, sometimes earlier on, repurposing is not new. Uh, what has happened is the pandemic has just accelerated the shift. And the team that is going to be uh, giving us more insights into this has had first-hand experience in repurposing, be it from a developer perspective, from, an, uh, from a design perspective, or from a, a consultancy perspective, and they'll be able to give us these insights. And without further much ado, let me welcome the team. And I'll start with Shavira. Shavira Bisesa, who is the Chief Operating Officer at Gateway Real Estate. Shavira joined Gateway Real Estate in short, Greer in 2019 as a chief operating officer and provides leadership and oversight on development of real estate projects and construction management. Shavira has extensive experience in short to long-term strategic planning initiatives for growth, business and development and continuous capability advancement and technical oversight on projects to ensure high quality service delivery. She's a recipient of the Golden Key Award from the International Honor Society and currently also lectures at the University of Cape Town's Business School as a subject matter expert on property. Who else better to have on this panel than her? Development of feasibility studies. She's an assessor on the Royal Institute of Chartered Service Surveyors Board, a member of the South African Council for Quantity Surveying Profession and Association for South African Quantity Surveyors. Welcome, Shavir. Next to Shavira is Steve McGuckin. Steve McGuckin heads the, uh, the client programs at Turner and Townsend. And Steve has been a member of Turner and Townsend senior team for 12 years. He joined the UK, he joined the UK MD as a UK MD, then was global MD for real estate and is currently the global head of client programs. 
Previously, for eight years, he was the development director and director of projects at Lansac PLC, which is we are, we are joined by his ex-colleague, also Neil, responsible for multiple projects of up to three billion sterling pounds in value. This included the redevelopment of broadcasting house for BBC, refurbishments of Queen's Anne's Gate for the MOJ, both are listed buildings. He led and completed over 5 billion of projects from inception to completion. And this is the wealth of experience that we'll be tapping on to Steve to, to help us understand this topic of repurposing more. And prior to Lansac, for eight years, Steve was at MIS, a director of consultancy, he provided development project and consultancy cost and, and, and consultancy to clients in both public and private sectors. A strategic thinker with strong motivational and pro professional skills, Steve brings directly relevant client-side experience and has special specialist expertise in residential, office, retail, and mixed-use sectors, and a track record of, complete, of completing complex and high-profile development projects, and particularly in London. It will be quite interesting to see uh, what Steve connects in terms of the main uses that he has been able to uh, have experience in and how interchangeably they can be used as far as we think of repurposing. Andrew Kilonzi. Andrew Kilonzi is a household name around the Kenyan construction industry. Andrew has contributed to the successful growth of Bogatman and Partners in Nairobi, practice with several local and international award-winning projects. The eight-year-old practice has recently been recognized as one of the top 100 companies in Kenya and has an ongoing work across education, residential, industrial, logistics projects, Recently, Andrew and his team have completed the Africa Logistic Property Warehouses in Tatu City, which received Africa's first Edge Industrial Development Certification. Kudos to you and your team. At least you're doing something towards sustainability and saving our environment. Ongoing work on his sector is the design and build of a number of facilities within the Tatu Industrial Development Park, as well as Great Urban Logistics and CTM. With a Bachelor's of Architecture from the University of Oregon, and a DIS, Denmark International Studies from the University of Copenhagen, Andrew brings a keen interest in developing, analyzing, and testing architectural solutions for clients. He is a proud member of the Architectural Association of Kenya. Interesting to see what conversation we will be having around the flexibilities of designs as far as the purpose thing is concerned and what we need to be on the lookout. Last but definitely not least, we have, so this actually not last, second last, but definitely not least, we have James Wilman, who's a Chief Executive Officer at Future Tech. James has been the CEO of Future Tech for the last six years, having served in other roles within the company over the last 12 years. Over the last three years, he's worked on more than three gigawatts of data center capacity. Interesting to see whether data centers will be one of the uses developers need to consider in terms of repurposing, whether it's feasible, whether it's not, we have the subject matter expert to guide us in the right direction. And these projects have varied and included concept, developed and detailed design, peer review, technical and commercial due diligence, commercial design, technology analysis and optimization, power outage, forensic engineering and life cycle consulting. During this engagement, he has seen designers, developers, investors and operators begin to make money off of the same mistakes. In each instance, he has worked with this teams identified and helped rectify these mistakes, adding value to the projects that he's been involved in. He has also engaged with organizations such as Uptime Institute, Royal Institute of British Architects, the Institute of Engineering and Technology, the British Standard, of, the British Standard Institute and the UK and European Data Center Association to gain further knowledge and insights. And as I said, last but not least, we have one of our prolific developers, that's Neil Black, representing Lansac. And Neil joined Lansac in 2003 for the delivery of the new BBC Scotland headquarters in Glasgow, following a career in main contracting. Since then, he has led the delivery of key developments in both former London and retail business units. He now heads the project management teams for the urban regeneration team and the retail slides of the business. So audience, viewers, and the team at large, you can see we have a good, good, good panel with wealth of experience in this topic. And without further much ado, I'd like to go straight into the conversation that we have planned for today, which is 
developing and repurposing for a new era. And to start us off, um, I'd like to pose uh, this question to Steve. And Steve, you are involved in helping a myriad of developers and their clients across the globe to develop the right space and at the right time and at the right cost. What are the trends you're seeing globally in terms of repurposing of non-performing properties for these companies? Thank you, Robert. Um, I suppose really the, 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 the obvious two asset classes that are, uh, I suppose, in the greater uh, distress at the moment are retail and uh, offices. Um, but it's not not all those assets are, are in trouble. Um, and the reality is that um, we're finding that uh, city centres uh, more recently have been um, suffering in terms of footfall. But interestingly, interestingly enough, suburban areas are actually finding um, greater footfall. So it's not all bad news. And we are finding that there is a, there's a dynamic going on that's quite difficult to predict in terms of, you know, where will the relative distribution of footfall and, and need for, need for um, different asset types, where will it land? And so I think the reality is that no one knows. We're all, we're all trying to work it through. Um, but I think the, the interesting thing is, as well as repurposing, developers are moving into other asset classes. You know, more traditionally, the institutional developers were either retail or office uh, um, focused, whereas now um, they are moving into other asset classes, such as data centers, logistics, biotech, specialist residential. And quite interesting, now we are seeing um, developers going into education. For example, Tishman Spare with Harvard uh, University and LNG, um, with Oxford, you know, look at 25 year deals. And so the world for developers is changing considerably in different parts of the world. Um, but I think, I think that um, one of the key things is, you know, who's going to drive a strategy in urban uh, areas for a coordinated change because developers are a fragmented bunch. And, you know, some more enlightened are trying to pull people together. But the reality is that the I suppose the reshaping, the repurposing, the, 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 the curation of urban um, uh, mixes. At the moment, we're seeing increasingly the civic authorities are stepping in and taking the lead. You know, in some cases, they're buying distressed assets so that they can actually take control of some of the key, um, the key anchors in city centres so that people do drive through solutions. Um, there are other things like people looking at co-locating services so that you could actually we take the medical services and social services, you could start to put those together in a hub, as opposed to people having to walk around or, or drive around different parts of, of uh, urban communities to find those support services that everybody needs. So there's um, quite a lot of change going on. Um, and a lot of people are talking about loose fits. We're looking at people trying to, developers trying to work with local authorities for flexible planning permissions. So they'll design a loose fit shell and core which could actually change uses. Uh, so a future planning permission might have a designated um, split of uses, but the order in which the, um, and where the developers bring that use online is more up to the developers following the market rather than strict planning control. So I think that uh, you know, we do need planners and developers to work together and the regulations to suit a changing market. Good, that's, that's quite insights. And, and Steve, would you say that this has been accelerated by the pandemic. Oh, absolutely, absolutely. I think the well, you did say that yourself. That the well, I think the well, there's two things. I think the the pandemic has accelerated the change. I mean, this is change that's happening anyway. You know, at conferences five, six, seven years ago were dealing with the fact that retail and office use patterns are changing and lease structures are changing because whereas before, you know, Neil and I at Landsec could sit back on 25 year leases and say, well, that's taken care of. There's lots of money. You know, now leases are more one year, five year. So developers are having to change um, their approach. And that changes the risk profile of um, major developments as well, because if you haven't got the income stream, you have to um, design it in such a way that you can repurpose in a shorter period, shorter time frame. Um, but I suppose the, I mean, obviously in terms of the rate of delivery of work, obviously, you know, it's well publicized in mature markets that um, COVID has slowed down construction capacity, it's interrupting supply chain so at the moment certainly in London everyone's looking um trying to second guess inflation and, and and supply chain capacity um but it may be I mean it may be a three it may be a six twelve month issue it could be longer than that we just don't know okay good thank you for that 
Neil, uh, one can't help to try and distinguish between repurposing, retrofitting, and regeneration. So that at any one point as we're speaking about repurposing, there's a clear distinction on, on these three elements as far as developers are concerned. And, and certainly with the experience that Landsec has, we would be willing to hear from you on what's the distinction on these three elements. A uh, very interesting question. Um, yeah, I personally consider retrofitting and repurposing to be distinctly different aspects. Um, for me, retrofitting is all about enhancing the existing function of a building by improving its built form. Um, whereas, I suppose, repositioning and repurposing is primarily challenging the existing function to see if it's still relevant and then remodeling its built form to suit any new purpose that's identified. Um, but I also add in the further dynamic of uh, regeneration, which is, is, is a more fundamental root and branch approach to both the form and function of an existing asset uh, and its place. Um, I suppose all of these aspects play a part in delivering what, multi what people are looking for in their property solutions. Um, and we are finding that um, flexibility just now, is just as Steve was mentioning, is probably one of the the prime motivating factors um, amongst all of our customers. I mean, from just in context, Landsec, we develop, own and operate uh, solely in the UK, primarily across uh, commercial, retail, leisure um, and residential asset classes. So um, in particular, we, pro we concentrate mostly in the London market. So what we are seeing from multinationals is that as long as the property solution isn't a distraction to their business as usual operations, then they will look at all opportunities, whether that's re uh, retrofitting or repurposing, reimagining or regeneration. But they definitely want to be it to be um, not distracting to their business. Okay. Okay. Good. And, and, and Neil, uh, Landsec being one of the leading real estate companies in the UK with a portfolio of about 2 million square metres, valued at about upwards of 10.8 billion. How has Landsec repurposed assets and how is Landsec looking to repurpose assets to remain resilient through the current decline in physical occupancies? Yeah, so we've got four main asset classes, as I said, the commercial London offices, prime shopping centre locations um, nationally, um, leisure, and um, we're entering into urban regeneration just now. And um, our central uh, London business, it represents two thirds of our value, but it's probably only a quarter of the floor space that we've got. Our leisure and our retail probably are um, a third of our floor space and they take, they're only about a sixth of the value. So it's quite a diverse but concentrated um, portfolio that we've got. And um, that diversity means that we have to tailor our approach to the individual needs of the portfolios and the individual assets as well. Um, just going back on what Steve was saying, I think um, the question of whether or not there is a decline in physical occupancy is actually quite nuanced. So there is a flight to prime. Land Securities um, concentrates on prime office and retail destinations. And the flight to prime has been accelerated through the pandemic of people wanting good office spaces. So we're not necessarily seeing a decline in occupancy in our offices just now because we are uh, city centre located and we're prime offices. Uh, secondary destinations are, I think, being more affected uh, just now than, than the prime destinations. Um, but that doesn't mean that we are resting on our laurels. We are constantly looking at what future trends are emerging for our occupiers, for our investors, and also for our um, our own colleagues. Um, but the one common thing that we are looking at and, and is crucial across all of the aspects is the gathering of uh, detailed data and research uh, to help underpin our decisions and strategies going forward in our portfolios and the individual assets as well. Um, we really need to understand what will drive um, property solutions in the short, medium and long term. Uh, it's not for us about uh, quick fixes. It's about ensuring that we build suitable blend of flexibility and durability for sustainable uh, solutions. So from our London commercial offices are characterised by, um, by the quality, the resilience, um, and I suppose the liquidity of our assets. Um, the majority have been developed and refurbished over the last 15 years. 
Um, but we recognise that there's a need, that need for flexibility is still there with our uh, customers. And that's why we've recently enhanced uh, our offering by producing and providing a flexible office uh, solution. And we've created that through retrofitting our existing assets. So we've got two assets that we've um, completely retrofitted and that has provided that flexible office space that our customers are, are now asking for. On the other hand, um, the pandemic has really materially accelerated the structural uh, changes and trends in, that are underway in the UK uh, retail market. And for the retail sector, it is clear that online uh, is the primary, primary growth uh, channel um, and will remain so for some time. Um, I don't, however, think that in any way signals the end uh, of uh, offering something um, of retail property. Instead, it probably means that um, its role must change um, in an omnichannel world, something that, um, or some, um, to something which is more compelling, either to be complementary to online or to offer something that we can't easily replace by online. So it's basically reimagining retail in all its forms, um, and we're doing that from first principles. Again, it's very much data and research led, and because of the um, scale of the challenge and the opportunities, it needs to evolve to provide um, sustainable short, medium and long term solutions. Nothing is ruled out. We're looking at a range of options, including um, right sizing retail provision by complementing it with a mixture of offices, leisure, residential. Steve mentioned uh, health and research and education. We're looking at all of those asset classes to see how they can complement our existing um, tenancies and customers. Um, and, it, and also support our local communities, because that's really important to us that we create places that support our local communities. I mean, our urban regeneration pipeline is a good example of that, because it's a really exciting opportunity and one that is um, concentrating on regenerating some of our existing retail assets into large scale residentially mixed use um, schemes. It's an extensive programme. Um, that will transform our physical assets and it should create really vibrant communities and I think that's really important to any development. So in essence we don't have a common solution but we do have a common approach and it's detail and research led to make sure that we're developing for the needs of the communities and our customers. Good. Thank you very much Neil. Interesting you uh, talk about how Lansac uh, will be relying on data to make their repurposing decisions. Be interesting to hear about data centers later on as I speak to James. But right now, I'd like to go to Shavir. And Shavir, listening to our counterparts in the UK, and as they, as they mentioned at the beginning, uh, one of the reasons for having this webinar is to share the knowledge from different parts of the world and to see how we can contextualize some of these things into our own continent. And in Africa, the concept of repurposing is relatively new in the construction space and has significantly morphed as a result of the pandemic and the rise in alternative property asset classes. What does Greer think about repurposing? So, um, thank you, Ramit. Um, you know, we approach repurposing in two ways. Uh, firstly, in its literal sense that uh, Neil just mentioned now, um, and in fact, taking current assets and converting it into new space. Uh, as an example, other developers, uh, like in South Africa, uh, we've seen that there uh, was an overload of office space even prior to COVID. Now, uh, the South African developers um, repurposing those, resident, uh, those assets into residential with a work from home type uh, apartment. Um, and the way GRIA, Gateway Real Estate Africa, and the way we look at repurposing, for us, it's a mind shift. And that mind shift means we are adopting a new corporate strategy uh, to, to accommodate emerging trends uh, on the back of the fourth industrial revolution. And I think uh, Neil uh, actually mentioned a lot about, you know, data centers and online shopping, et cetera. And um, I, I'm a firm believer that what happens in the UK and the US uh, ultimately filters down into the African continent, uh, similar to, you know, other industries like uh, MasterChef and uh, Minute to Win It and programs like that. They start uh, in the UK and in the US first uh, before it filters down to the African continent. So uh, similarly, um, 
this means that you know as Gria, uh, we're looking at our approach very differently uh, and our investment philosophy is uh, to include uh, data centers and warehousing. And I think uh, for us, it's about uh, embracing the fourth industrial revolution. And uh, because of COVID, uh, many had to adopt the fourth industrial revolution very quickly. And uh, we find more and more consumers wanting to shop online. And this calls for a need for data centers uh, and attached to that, uh, obviously, warehousing and logistics space. So that's how we are looking at uh, repurposing. Good. Thank you. Um, Andrew. As one of the leading designers, what are some of the complexities that we need to consider when repurposing struggling assets in Africa? Yeah, thanks, Robert. Um, and, and for me, I can, I can talk about the complexities, but uh, first of all, these complexities of repurposing and reimagining, they have actually created an opportunity that is uh, a big ideal. I think uh, when we talked with Neil previously, uh, I, I insisted that, you know, rather than repurposing and reimagining, regeneration is a bigger item. And, you know, the, the idea of regeneration uh, has not been new in Africa. I know we are saying that repurposing and uh, reimagining um, has been, of course, uh, pushed on by, by the pandemic. But at Buchetman, we've always looked at regeneration uh, from a thought leadership point. Um, and Neil touched on detail and research led, uh, you know, approach towards repurposing and regeneration. Uh, at Buchetman, we've really uh, tried to be thought leaders and not reactive only to uh, you know issues that are being brought up by the by, by the pandemic, uh, and we've done a lot of research and documented it uh, in what we are terming designing the future. So when you think about designing the future, uh, it might speak to these complexities. Then, uh, Robert, that uh, you're mentioning around repurposing, and we know some of these complexities touch on code fire requirements, lack of updated uh, land use plans. Of course, in most master plan cities in Nairobi, in, uh, in Africa, like in Africa, because uh, compared to, uh, it's been interesting listening to our counterparts in London, they're working with well-planned uh, and well-documented, uh, you know, settlements and, and master plans. We don't have that information in Africa, uh, and especially in emerging markets. So lack of that uh, information is a complexity and also you have a lot of master plans that are newer so that adds another complexity to 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 the whole process of uh, repurposing and 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 you know reimagining properties now somebody touched uh, touched on coordination between developers not that information not being there what we are finding as well in terms of a complexity is you have a lot of competing developers and they might have a similar idea rather than combine for a bigger ideal uh, when they're repurposing or reimagining uh, properties. So that's another complexity. Um, we can't touch enough on the coordination aspect on approving authorities uh, that might limit the ideas and the intent that a developer, a designer might have around repurposing uh, an asset. So there's a lot of complexities definitely uh, in, in repurposing, but you know, as consultants in the built environment, for us, it's, 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 it's more important that we take these complexities and convert them to an opportunity. And that opportunity is to actually look at this topic, you know, repurposing and reimagining and regeneration as a totally different mindset, and uh, Shavira talked about it a little bit, a totally different mindset in terms of how you approach design and, and what designing for the future is. Oh, okay. Andrew, I'll, I'll, I'll get back to you on, uh, on, on some of those complexities, especially so that you can elaborate to us more on then what, what should developers think differently to avoid these complexities. But yeah, I would, I'd like definitely. to go back to, to Shavir, and, and um, it's interesting uh, how Greya looks at repurposing, not only from a physical perspective, but from a change of mindset, uh, so that we, 
we can all we can we can uh, be prepared for these changes that we are seeing in the market. And in light of that earlier sentiment on the softer elements of repurposing on how you plan projects, please share with us Greer success factors in your current developments that have come across as a result of this mind sh shift in mind mind mindset. Okay. Uh, thanks, Robert. So, you know, from a Greer perspective, uh, we've actually broke ground in the last, um, you know, eight months on uh, three different projects, uh, all in line with our new aligned mind shift corporate strategy, if you want to call it that, uh, with regard to repurposing. And those projects cater for data center development. Uh, we successfully broke ground in, uh, in Lagos at the beginning of this year for a new data center. And for us, um, it's about uh, working with the right consultants um, consultants that are in the forefront of innovation and technology that embrace the fourth industrial revolution. I think that's a quite a big thing for us as, as a gateway. Um, but also, you know, we were able to collaborate uh, very well with our consultants and, you know, professional teams in the various countries. Um, we were very used to a flexible working environment even before COVID. Um, Many of our uh, consultants and our development managers are used to working from the project countries, uh, from home, from uh, you know different places. So uh, we we embrace the fourth industrial revolution with the use of online meetings and digital. So I think um, you know despite the pandemic, we were able to to you know break ground in these countries and uh, repurpose our mind shift and strategy to focus on uh, those key sectors that are actually high yielding assets at the moment for us. So it's quite exciting, uh, despite the challenge. Um, Gria actually created a risk strategy as soon as we heard about the pandemic in 2019 in, in, in China and, and, and then in the UK, uh, we developed a, a risk analysis and, and strategy that basically focused on if we have were hit to the, with the pandemic, how are we going to manage our projects? And uh, when it did hit Africa, uh, we, we were very well aware of how we're going to deal with the situation, how we were going to break down in the various countries and uh, shift our mindset from a repurposing point of view in terms of focusing on the right sectors, uh, being data centers, healthcare and industrial, and also corporate residential. Okay, thank you very much. And uh, James, this comes to you. I think each and every panelist has mentioned data centers and it has become quite a trendy thing in various of the markets that we operate in. Uh, please enlighten us on whether one from your experience, you have seen any repurposed uh, assets into data centers, how easy that has been. Is it a fallacy that you can repurpose um, an asset into a data center? How easy is it and should developers be considering this or not? Thanks, Robert. Um, the, the way we look at a data center is to envisage it as a machine that's wrapped in a building. So the building as a general rule should be highly optimized around the machine because the machine makes up around about 80% of the capital cost of the building. Um, you can repurpose other buildings into data centers um, however, um, if it's a small enterprise facility or perhaps if it's a small retail facility, then repurposing a building may be possible. But as particularly the tier one African market um, begin to move towards a more wholesale environment and the data centers that are being built, the new assets coming to market are going to be in line with the standard international um, uh, uh, um, requirements for international clients, you'll find significant challenges with repurposing buildings. Um, and this comes down to really simple things, floor to ceiling heights, um, you know, ideally for a wholesale data center, you're looking at a minimum of six meters. Obviously you could do less, but, but, but six to seven meters is gonna be optimal. Um, with the new wholesale facilities we're working in, you're looking at 15 kilonewtons per square meter as floor loadings. 
Um, that, that certainly wouldn't be the case for, for office facilities, um, you know, perhaps five kilonewtons a square metre. So we just start getting into the, the real simplistic elements of building design um, that, that, that really mean that unless you're repurposing um, perhaps a, a, a logistics warehouse, uh, for example, that may work well as repurposing to a data centre. But as two asset classes go, and, and as the panel have already spoken about, data centres and, and logistics are two asset classes that are doing very well at the moment. So, so whether you would repurpose a warehouse into a data centre is, is perhaps debatable. Oh, thank you. Interesting. It would be interesting to hear the sentiments of the two developers. Um, as far as their portfolios and whether they were looking into repurpose any of their developments into data centers, you quite see the considerations that one has to make um, to, to, to go that direction. Any, any one of the developers who has had an experience in trying to repurpose to a data center? Between Shabia and Neil? We're going on you, eh? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, for, for us, when we look at the sheer density of building services in a data centre versus a, a more traditional building, whatever it may be, um, we just, just uh, again, it's, it's this thing of this, this building has to house the data centre infrastructure. And, you know, the way we approach design is to effectively design the, the data centre infrastructure first, starting at the, the rack, uh, and going out to the, the, the transformer, out to the grid supply, out to the generators. And when that is optimised, then look at putting a building around it. And, um, and when, when we, uh, you know, approach uh, a, a, a project in that way, um, finding a building that's suitable to repurpose comes with challenges. And we are working on a repurposing project at the moment, not, not in um, Africa, it's, it's elsewhere in the world. It's, it's um, uh, repurposing a brewery uh, into a 40 megawatt data centre. Um, and the brewery is a very, very large open space. Um, and it still comes with challenges. Yeah, it still comes with challenges, even when you're dealing with a large open space, um, just because of the sheer density of services and, and having to put them in. So, um, yeah, certainly from our side, uh, uh, and particularly in a market like Nairobi, that we're going to see this shift from a more traditional um, sort of retail focused market moving into a wholesale focused market that 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 um, exaggerates the difficulties with repurposing even more for the asset class. Robert, we are we are actually seeing in, uh, in America, there's what's termed the zombie mouths and uh, they're mouths which just aren't getting a footfall and they because they've got multiple retailers, they tend to have the power, the power capacity. So we are seeing some zombie mouths in America turning into data centers. And, and, and Stephen, I'm not very familiar with, with ball design, but is that because fundamentally, once you've taken out the individual retail units, you've yeah. actually got a great big shed? Yeah, yeah well, they are. Yeah, I mean, in, in the States, the, the sort of the non-prime mouths tend to be pretty much almost like a warehouse divided up space frame type structures so it actually lends itself quite nightly and you know and often the petitions are, are, are dry lining you know rather than block and stuff like that so you actually find they were designed for flexibility of retail layout and then that lends itself nicely to getting a clear space yeah Ro robert we're actually sorry we're actually in a design session this morning on a logistics park and of course noting that data centers are uh, there's quite a bit of demand for that in the market in Nairobi. Uh, th there was actually a discussion this very morning around uh, flexibility and designing with an idea to adapt, you know, a logistics facility to a uh, data center in future. So it's a, it's a real conversation. Repurposing and reimagining is not only happening on older buildings that are being repurposed, even new designs. You have to design with an idea that you might repurpose in future. Which is what Shavir was talking about, repurposing our mindset in terms of uh, first principles of design. When we come back into that, interesting to see that what is coming out of this is there has to be a consideration, whether from a planning perspective or from a developer perspective, on the compatibility of asset classes and uses when you think about repurposing, so that it, it actually does make business case rather than uh, uh, the opposite of that. And Steve, uh, while we're on this, how is Turner in terms of using their experience and their data to help developers in other parts of the world understand the economic viability of repurposing schemes and assets? Thank, thank you, Robert. Um, conscious of time, I'll be reasonably brief on this one because um, it might sound a little bit like an advertorial. Um, 
I think the, I mean, the main thing is inevitably it's uh, our data lake. I mean, what's great about digital is that uh, we're now able to join up um, cost data in real time around the world. And we do um, publish annually our uh, international market survey. And that takes uh, approximately 50 markets around the world. And it does a uh, cost uh, comparison of different asset types. And it also looks at the, um, the market conditions and how we think uh, demand and costs are likely to shift. So that's really helpful in comparing potential uh, changes of asset use or multiple asset uses. And also for international investors, it enables them to compare the attractiveness of markets as well. Um, so it's very useful in feasibility work. And I think that the second thing we're working on in terms of knowledge, is about knowledge and data in terms of knowledge. In, in the UK, we've been working with the UK government on um, retrofitting public and uh, private space, particularly with a point of view of uh, reduction in the carbon footprint, but also retrofitting in terms of other uses. And that's given us a lot of experience on, you know, how do you um, retrofit individual portfolio uh, portfolios of assets and I think we'll probably come out a bit later that's going to become an increasingly important uh, uh, toolkit uh, for a developer. Okay thank you very much. Andrew um, I'm going to ask this question in two parts because you represent a lot of multinationals who come into Africa and they're looking for a repurposed space if at all it's not a greenfield space. Uh, what are they looking for from such portfolios? And number two, what are the benefits of repurposing those portfolios in a sustainable way? Okay, so Robert, I'll just answer that question in keywords that you hear in, uh, in development circles in, you know, in a market like Nairobi. So you'll hear words like grade A, sustainability, net zero, security. Um, you know, we've talked about different funding structures, managing credit, technology there's a lot of technical requirements now key one is becoming flexibility and designing uh, such that there's flexibility for different uses so all these um all these words and keywords they actually define the needs for multinationals especially who are entering uh, you know the uh, an emerging market like africa and of course the assets that they find in the space currently don't meet uh, you know the standards that they're talking about that's why you'll hear those keywords so i think they speak to their needs um then uh the second part there on rethinking how you design for sustainability, and I know it has been a key word uh, in a lot of, you know, different uh, developers and consultants uh, circles, is really net zero and designing for a zero carbon footprint. And the biggest item around repurposing, reimagining, regeneration of neighborhoods is if you look at the amount of debris from construction, 90% of it comes from demolition of assets that could otherwise have been repurposed. So th that last item on net zero and sustainability and a zero carbon footprint is really a keyword about thinking on um, uh, the future around how we'll be designing for repurposing. So basically the industry has a second chance uh, to correct our historical errors in terms of pro protecting the environment. And we can yes. do this through having some good sustainable practices and behaviors towards yes. the repurposing. Uh, still yes. on the topic of sustainability, Neil, uh, as, as Landsec, I know you take sustainability very key to all your activities and all your developments. Uh, please walk us through the materials that Landsec use in retrofitting buildings, and what advice Landsec can give developers in Africa when it comes to alternative materials that can really make an impact even as we think about repurposing assets. Neil, I have you on I had the schoolboy error of leaving my mute on. Um, I, hopefully you can now hear me. Um, I'll try to be brief, um, but not because sustainability is not important to us. I mean, as a business, we're fully committed to, to being net zero carbon by 2030. I mean, it's really core to our whole business strategy moving forward. And it's really important to our investors, our customers and our colleagues. So um, ESG is 
probably the prime motivating factor for a lot of our, what we do just now. Um, as far as materials are concerned, um, basic advice is try to think locally, social materials locally. Um, we have, as a business, uh, determined that we will uh, try to source all of our materials from within the UK or Europe, and that reduces the amount of um, transportation uh, mileage associated with getting to our sites. Um, and um, the other aspect, which I think is key to um, sustainability, is trying to, because we're talking about retrofitting, is particularly trying to use high recycled contents of steelwork and uh, concrete. Um, because they are huge contributors to um, carbon, embodied carbon. Um, the other materials which are um, really helpful uh, in reducing embodied carbon are uh, timber in particular. Um, it's got a dual aspect because it's lightweight, so we're, we're using um, timber to um, increase um, net internal area by adding floors onto buildings which previously um, weren't capable of taking um, additional floors that were um, st structural concrete. Um, so we're being able to add more floors onto buildings without um, having to demolish. Um, and, um, but it is important that when you're using timber that you take it from a sustainable source um, to prevent deforestation. Um, and I suppose another uh, one that we've been looking at recently is cork. It's a really good material. It's biodegradable and has really low embodied carbon. But I think the two takeaways I would say is think locally, source as much as you can locally and um, source as much recycled content as you can as well. And that, that applies anywhere on the globe. Yep. Thank you very much. Good, interesting lessons there from what Lansac is doing. And, and James, uh, data centers being one of the biggest energy consumer asset classes that are there. Uh, there's a lot of talk about sustainability in DCs and it's, it's catching on in Africa, but we'd like to hear your insights as to how sustainability is being introduced in DCs and feasible renewals elsewhere and whether there's anything we can start adopting. So the, the, the biggest ongoing cost associated with data centers is energy. So the data center market really since the late noughties, um, mid noughties has been focused on energy efficiency and reducing that. Um, back then, it wasn't so much about sustainability. Back then it was about, um, you know, increasing the profitability of organizations, yeah? So for us, it's very natural to design systems that are as energy efficient as they can be, um, while still being um, feasible to construct with regard to cost per kilowatt. Um, I think the area that's most exciting for data centers is around um, renewable energy and using the right types of renewable energy. And again, this is great because it's renewable and we can talk about the sustainability factor, but actually or, or often renewable energy can be at a much lower cost per kilowatt hour as well. Um, if you look at um, um, uh, hydropower in the Nordics, um, you could be paying three or four euro cents a kilowatt hour versus um, 14 to 16, or certainly 12 to 16 in Germany, for example. So, so uh, the, you know, there's a big driver. The, the industry, it, it, with its main overhead being power, we're already massively driven to be as sustainable as we can be. Um, and that's um, uh, really not necessarily realised by people that aren't in the industry. I think then when we talk about embedded carbon and, and really to Neil's point that, that all of the efforts that Neil uh, talked about around sourcing locally, th these things, they make sense for a sustainability perspective, but also in less mature markets um, in, in the tier one and tier two African markets, being sensitive to local supply chain capabilities is actually what's going to make your project more buildable it's going to increase buildability and and the byproduct of that is that you're then sourcing more locally and hopefully having a more sustainable and, and lower and, and lower footprint so so all of these things are symbiotic um you know uh, you can increase you can um upskill the local supply chain um you can actually have a more resilient supply chain um and and you can have a faster build and at the same time you're reducing the the, the you know the carbon and, and pollution associated with um, bringing materials to to a location that doesn't necessarily support those building methodologies. So, so th th there's a lot of benefits around this sustainability approach. Um, 
which, which are a lot more than just reducing carbon footprint. Uh, um, you know, it's 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 more complex to that, and um, it's far more nuanced than, than than that sort of very simplistic view. Yeah, I think what I hear there is that emphasis on the local supply chain and support on the local supply chain to reduce that carbon footprint. And before we move on to that the, the topic on sustainability and repurposing, or did I, Shavir, do you want to say something? Because oh, I was coming to you on Greer's uh, sustainability agenda. Uh, and Greer positions itself as a real estate development company specializing in turnkey construction of accommodation and multinational, multinational corporate and retail expanding into Africa. Where does sustainability sit on Greer's agenda? So uh, definitely at the top of our agenda, um, sustainability linked with environmental, social and governance for us is our number one priority as a business. And um, I think it's every developer's responsibility to keep ESG and sustainability as part of their uh, number one uh, priority within their business. And uh, as Gateway, we actually uh, make an impact from an ESG perspective in every project country that we work in. Uh, that is our initiative. And uh, as an example, in Kenya, we both broke ground towards the end of the year in a, a new corporate residence for uh, the US Embassy. And uh, we've, uh, we've actually linked up with a program called Build Her, which is a nonprofit organization. And as part of Gateway, our sustainable development goals is um, gender equality. And uh, this actual NGO for Build Her uh, they basically as, assist in and training women in uh, a male-dominated industry to be able to lay bricks, um, tile, paint, plaster, basically all the building trades from a finisher's point of view and from a structural point of view. So when we heard about the program, we were very excited about it. Um, we actually provided a scholarship to 14 women within the community uh, to be part of the program. And uh, we are also uh, involved in a back-to-back -back agreement with our uh, principal contractor who uh, employ these women that leave the program. And we're quite proud to say that 25% of the workforce on that project site are actually women. So uh, very much, uh, you know, the people side and the environmental side is also important. Uh, all our buildings obviously have the uh, sustainability and green star rating. Uh, it's a huge initiative from our side because not only does it help from an operations and life cycle cost point of view, it, it, it's also helping the climate change and, and, you know, the future of our world. Shifting our mindset and repurposing how we think. Exactly. And in line with that, Steve, about 40% of the UK's carbon footprint comes from the built environment. And as we're changing our mindset to net zero, both from a corporate perspective as an industry perspective, and even as we're thinking of this topic of repurposing, what kind of benefits would will property developers and corporates be seeing or be tapping in by taking a more sustainable approach in, in, in building? Sustainable. Keep you on yeah, sorry, that was for me, Robert. Yeah, thank you. Um, to, uh, to my mind, at the moment, different countries are, I suppose, progressing at different speeds, and that's not necessarily maturity. It's just you know, some, some underdeveloped countries are actually quite sustainable because they actually have had to make resources work very hard historically, anyway. Um, but generally in the mature markets, the legislation really is driving um, a lot of the, uh, um, I suppose, the change, but also protection of asset values and protection of share price. Um, so uh, additionally, I think that um, increasingly, well, investors and corporates are very concerned that the design performance um, demonstrates the values of sustainability uh, and uh, mindfulness in terms of uh, quality of workplace. So the reality is that, you know, it is actually part of corporate values, um, but it's also part of institutional values. And Neil mentioned uh, ESG before, economic, social and governance. Increasingly now, grade one investors have to be seen to be mindful of not just profit, 
for total return for the, uh, the environment and society uh, as well as investors and so that's becoming built into share prices um, over time and asset value so we have seen a number of uh, investors um, uh, going through their portfolio and divesting um, poor performing assets from an environmental and sustainability point of view. Okay, um, I think there's a background noise coming from uh, EAPI, so please, if someone can mute the mic. Um, just cognizant, cognizant of time, and I'd like to give about 15 minutes for the Q&A. So I'd, I'd just like to go to the last question to open it up to the panelists. Now, I think we've, we've discussed repurposing from a project-specific angle, whereby we are repurposing individual asset classes to different asset classes. But there's a bigger play that local authorities and municipalities need to have in this. And a case in point is whereby we see zones that end up with developments that are non-performing because not, not because the developers did anything wrong, but it's just that the market trend have caught up with them because the local institutions did not either provide enough data or enough guidance on the uses of these developments. So just virtually around the table and, and probably starting from Neil, um, followed by Steve, and, and then Andrew, James, feel free to chime in. Can, it, can you just hear about what your thoughts are as to what local industries, local municipalities and councils need to do on this uh, topic of repurposing? Did you want me to start off, Robert? Yes. Yes, please, Neil. Yeah, sure. Um, so in our background, I think we are seeing, well, no local authority wants to see distressed assets uh, on its patch. Um, and therefore, they're incentivized to try, because it has a mushrooming effect. Um, if you've got a distressed asset, it then creates um, a negative atmosphere around it, and that can then spiral out of control. So local authorities are incentivized to prevent um, assets from becoming distressed. And one of the ways that they can help is by providing tax efficient um, solutions for the developers. We've in the UK looked at various ways that that can um, take place. There is a, a system called taxing increment financing, which came, which actually started in America. And basically it looks at um, the generation of non-domestic rates through new business opportunities on blighted sites, and that can be used to help fund uh, public infrastructure, as in public realm, um, infrastructure for um, energy, those type of things, and that can be paid by the local authority. So if they've got skin in the game, and they have already got skin in the game, because as, as I said, they don't like, they, they don't want distressed assets on their patch. Um, if they've got more financial skin in the game, then that's how you can get leverage most advantage out of local authorities. Okay, thank you. And Steve, yeah. should you be thinking this from a macro level, whereby cities and municipalities should be repurposing rather than us thinking of individual projects and buildings? Yeah, and I think the um, well, I think there's two things. Number one, in, in different countries, the planning system uh, varies, and you know, some it enables, and others, the plan, the legis legislation, and the politics make development very difficult. So I think number one, you've got to make the systems easier so that you try and, dare I say, trust developers a bit more so that we can actually um, make things happen quickly. That's number one. And I think the second thing is you know, the, the, the mayor or whatever, or the leader of the council, they have to develop a vision. What's the purpose? What are we really trying to achieve in, in, a, in that community? And a lot of that's about consultation and bringing the community with you. Then I think the third thing is creating forums whereby developers feel they can talk Okay. So developers can talk openly about uh, um, their their ambitions. So it isn't they're not hiding their ambitions. Good. Uh, Thank and you. Uh, the, the, the whole is greater than the sum of the parts. Andrew, just a quick half half a minute wrap up yeah. on the local authorities. Robert, there's a very big role in terms of creating forums to just uh, have discussions with local authorities so that we can collectively inform um, what the zoning ordinances or, or planning uh, and revision on zoning ordinances is. Um, I think we've been on the forefront here in Nairobi and you're well aware uh, in 
sharing information of projects that we are involved in that have a big impact that might affect uh, the bigger idea in terms of planning. And it's just about creating that forum through organizations like Kenya Property Development Association and just being as engaged as we can. Okay, good. Thank you very much. James, I'd not like to leave this audience without an answer. The, the, the question here is, what are your views on the micro data centers? We have noted a trend within new offices and mixed use buildings in Kenya to accommodate data centers within their projects. And what are the key factors to be considered? Yeah, so the it ultimately it comes down to your business case and your um, tenant, your target tenants. So yes, you absolutely can convert space for certain tenants and that may be suitable. However, as a can market you hear me? Yes, we can, APR. Excellent. Fantastic. I wasn't very sure. Sadly, I'm having to jump right into the middle of this conversation where I myself am writing notes because of the nature of it. And um, but so unfortunately, we do need to stop here, ladies and gentlemen. Uh, please forgive me for jumping into it um, uh, rather sort of heavy. <laughs> but uh, um, um, Robert, indeed, thank you. Thank you so very, very much uh, for that conversation and to everyone else as well.